Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, this talk on fakes and forgeries, and in particular on the Wolfgang and Elaine Veltraki case uh, that occurred in 2006, 2007. Uh, I hope you'll find it as fascinating as I did when I lived through it uh, in 2006, 2007, uh, while I was working at Christie's. Uh, I'm now a specialist uh, in, and an advisor in Impressionist and uh, Modern Art. And when this affair happened, uh, I worked for Christie's as um, uh, a senior specialist in the Impressionist and Modern Department. So I followed this affair quite closely. And, uh, and it's absolutely staggering how uh, the Beltraki couple uh, cheated and uh, uh, the whole art market uh, for many, many years. Uh, to begin with, um, it took me a long time to address uh, fakes and forgeries in a conference because in our market, everybody's sort of reluctant to discuss this matter because obviously uh, it destabilizes uh, the specialist, it destabilizes the market, and it's very, very hurtful for the artists themselves. And oftentimes we forget that. We forget that uh, the artist's reputation is tarnished by all this. Uh, and uh, I'm always surprised how the media uh, describes uh, forgers uh, as sort of Robin Hood heroes. And they always look at them uh, with a certain envy or a certain admiration. Uh, and I think that's completely wrong. Uh, nevertheless, I went ahead and did a conference um, and I did the present talk uh, because um, a few years ago, I went to uh, the Royal Museum of Brussels. Uh, that was reopening after a long restoration. And I met there the senior curator uh, who explained to me that the museum had been restored uh, 40 years before already. And uh, when they had the opening uh, in the 60s, uh, of course, the King of Brussels, of Belgium, uh, came to the opening and uh, he was quite young at the time, the young Roi Baudouin. And uh, he wasn't really familiar with the art world. And he was introduced to René Magritte, who was still alive, and uh, he didn't know what to say to René Magritte. Uh, so the only thing he could come up with was to say, Mr. Magritte, I'm so glad you're here because with your presence here, we're absolutely sure there are no fakes and forgeries by Magritte in the museum. Uh, Magritte found it pretty funny. And a few weeks later, he dropped off this small, tiny little work, uh, Ceci n'est pas un faux, uh, that he offered to the museum, uh, saying it will reassure uh, his majesty and uh, you can rest assured that there's no fakes uh, in the museum. So I thought that if an artist like Magritte can openly discuss fakes and forgeries, I can certainly do the same. And what we're going to discuss today uh, is certainly, and so far, uh, one of the greatest stories of forgers of the 21st century. Uh, there were others, uh, but this one, uh, we're fortunate uh, to have the work of art, to have the maker. Uh, oftentimes, you don't know. Uh, who the forger is. Uh, you just find a work of art and you never go back up to the source of who created it. Uh, and uh, we also had a trial. So we have a lot of information to share. And having worked at Christie's, uh, I also experienced hands-on uh, the actual fakes that he produced. Um, in the end, Mr. Baltraki spent uh, six years in jail. Uh, it was only daytime jail. And, um, and now he's making his own art, uh, which of course is of little value. Uh, what's interesting uh, in the Beltraki case is that it concerns him, but it also concerns his wife. And what I wanna focus on is not the painterly talent that he had to create these fakes and forgeries, but um, his technique uh, to cheat everyone. And his technique was to anticipate everything. Uh, he knew exactly uh, what uh, we were going to do, what we were going to ask for, what we were going to look for in a painting. And he anticipated uh, all the questions we may have had, not by providing the answers, uh, but by giving us leads for us to find the answers ourselves. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Beltraki uh, in uh, the early 2000s uh, focused on uh, the movements and the art movements uh, that were successful at the time. Uh, and notably, uh, abstract German expressionist, uh, Mr. Wolfgang Beltraki was German. Uh, also surrealism, and his particular uh, Max Ernst, uh, and Fauvism, 
Uh, these were three movements that were extremely popular in the years 2000, and therefore he decided to focus on them. So first thing he did is identify uh, the different artists and the different markets uh, that could bring him a lot of money. Uh, there's also, uh, and there's often a preconceived idea um, that the forger uh, is trying to establish himself uh, a reputation as an artist, and that's the primary reason why uh, he fakes paintings. Uh, and Mr. Beltraki himself always said, you know, that no one recognized his own work as an artist, and frustrated, uh, he wanted to impose himself uh, by showing the world that he was just as good as famous artists by forging them. And that's complete uh, deception and deceiving, because the reality is, is that uh, Mr. Beltraki was driven uh, by money and money only. And that was his only motivation uh, for making these works. So he, he identified uh, these three currents that were quite successful at the time, and he started forging them. Uh, what is fascinating is that he undoubtedly had the talent uh, to reproduce or to inspire himself and in being able to copy the stylistic painterly style of several artists. But more importantly, he was able to create a whole pedigree for the works he offered for sales. Uh, first of all, what he did is he took the catalog resumes of several artists, uh, notably Durin, Max Ernst, Campendonc, uh, took the catalog resumes and tried to identify uh, those works that were recorded in the catalog resumes, but not illustrated. That were usually accompanied by just a note saying location unknown. Uh, and what he did, uh, he inspired himself from uh, the details that were available in the catalog resume without the illustration to create the matching uh, illustration uh, that would match the description uh, of the painting. Uh, what he would also do uh, is he knew, and nobody knows exactly how he figured it out, uh, that specialists and that the market looked at the painting, certainly, and looked at the work of art, but looked mostly uh, at the verso, or turned around the painting and looked at the stretcher and looked at all the labels and the provenance to justify the authenticity of the work. And what he did is um, he took great pain, even greater pain, uh, to recreate entire pedigrees uh, for works of art. Um, here we have a sample of everything he did, uh, notably uh, reproduce and gave provenance uh, of German galleries, and notably Der Storm. Der Storm was a super important gallery at uh, the early 20th century. Um, and uh, was uh, Mr. Fleischstein was the director of Der Storm. And, um, uh, and the correspondent of the great Kahnweiler Gallery. And he created these great labels uh, that he carefully applied on the stretchers of his paintings, uh, labels that for us specialists uh, were absolute blue chip labels, uh, and that were sustained by major exhibitions uh, that Der Storm uh, and Kahnweiler had in the 20s and 30s. It's really interesting because uh, what he also did is uh, he checked uh, for exhibitions of these artists by these galleries. Uh, and at the time, uh, when Der Storm, for example, in the 20s, uh, published an exhibition catalog, of course, they couldn't afford reproductions. And they simply listed the work by a title. And often, they didn't even put the dimensions of the work. So it was very easy um, for Mr. Beltraki to attribute uh, a certain number and a painting uh, to an exhibition number in the catalog exhibition. Uh, because of course it wasn't illustrated, so nobody could prove that it wasn't that one. Uh, so first, identifying in the catalog resume something that's not illustrated, but that's recorded. Two, recreate an entire provenance and an exhibition list, uh, which is quite daring, uh, by reproducing labels and attributing numbers to his works. And then um, for the provenance, uh, he invented completely with his wife, uh, the provenance of uh, Jaeger, Werner Jaeger. Uh, Werner Jaeger was uh, the grandfather uh, of Mrs. Hélène Beltraki. And uh, they spread the rumor uh, that he was in a very, very important 
uh, industrialist in Cologne, and that he collected in the early 20s and 30s some major works that he purchased notably from the Der Sturm Gallery, uh, and that, of course, with the rise of the Nazi movement in the 30s, uh, these works were considered as degenerate, and he had to hide them. Uh, and that's why these works supposedly disappear for so many years. And later on, his granddaughter uh, started to sell them in the early 2000s. Uh, so by adding this provenance uh, of uh, Werner Jaeger, uh, he consolidated the pedigrees of these works because not only now they had famous exhibition record to their Storm and Tannweiler, but they also had an outstanding provenance uh, to the point that uh, when we as specialists at Christie's saw the provenance of Werner Jaeger, we immediately knew who he was and we said, yes, he's an important industrialist from Cologne and this is a very good sign and we knew the story. Uh, so by creating this pedigree, uh, what he did is he reassured the market and uh, if we had any doubts, uh, we had trace. Uh, we had trace of the work uh, with the Der Storm catalogs, uh, we had a provenance, it was in the catalog resume, and it was convincing not only to us, but also to the author of the catalog resume and the uh, nominated expert uh, for the artist. Um, so it was quite complete and extremely, extremely well done. Uh, what he even did uh, to uh, consolidate his position and consolidate the provenance of this work uh, is he provided photographs of Mr. Werner Jaeger's wife uh, sitting in the dining room uh, with the works of art on the wall. Uh, and of course, uh, the photo you see here is completely fake. It's not Hélène Beltraki's grandmother that you see here, it's Hélène herself, uh, who aged herself and who wore a 1930s dress, a pearl necklace, and of course, uh, recreated uh, the dining room with the face of her husband. Uh, and then Volgang Beltraki went to the length of finding an old camera, old film, and, uh, um, and took these pictures uh, and these photographs that were very, very difficult uh, to be proven fake, and nobody doubted them. Uh, so the photo you see here is completely fake, but it gave enormous credibility to the Werner Jaeger provenance. We sold a couple of works at Christie's uh, back in 2006, 2007, uh, without any doubts. Not great masterpieces, but important works, uh, such as the ones you see here. Uh, here's a work uh, by Campendonc and uh, one uh, by uh, André Durand, uh, Les Bateaux à Coulure, uh, which sold for $4 million de Durand, so that was quite a bit of money. Uh, and the Campendon for $600,000. Now, what's important is that for a long time, uh, Beltraki didn't decide uh, to forge great paintings or create masterpieces by the artist. Uh, he, more often than not, created secondary works, like many artists do. Uh, and therefore, um, we didn't spend a great amount of time uh, looking at these works because we considered them secondary, but we never doubted them. Um, what's important is that they came to us and they were offered to us by reputable dealers that had purchased them from Beltraki uh, with the certificate of authenticity uh, from uh, the leading specialist and the recognized specialist in its field. Uh, so we absolutely had no doubt uh, about their authenticity. Uh, today, of course, when we juxtapose these two uh, paintings, we see similarities uh, in the tonalities and, and when you look at the Kappen you're like, there's something strange about this painting. Um, and uh, that's something oftentimes after the fact, that's very easy to say uh, that there's something strange about them. Uh, but at the time when we sold them, we had absolutely no reason to doubt uh, that they were fakes uh, and that they were made by somebody else than the official uh, author. Uh, what's interesting about these two pictures is that Beltraki never went to the open market. Uh, he had a network of people uh, who would purchase the works from him at very low prices. And three or four years later, they would resurface on the market, having gone from one dealer to the next. Um, 
And these two works, when uh, we realized that there was a strange, uh, strong chances that they were uh, fakes, uh, we, uh, we called the buyers and we took them back to Christie's London and uh, were able to analyze them. Uh, so that was really what convinced us and what allowed us uh, to determine that they were real fakes and forgeries. Um, now, he could have gone on for many, many years doing fakes and nobody would have known uh, until he made a significant mistake. Uh, he was so good at answering our questions before we even asked them that when we saw the work of art, we knew, uh, we knew that they were genuine because we knew they already had a certificate uh, from Mrs. Firminish in the case of a cap and donk, uh, from um, the leading expert for Max Ernst. Uh, it just felt right. And in the back, we had the labels, we had the pedigree, so we had everything. So we had absolutely, again, no reason to doubt. Uh, until uh, Mr. Beltraki saw that the market was making money on his back. Uh, basically, he saw these works of art coming back to the market and making prices that were a lot higher than what he had sold them for initially. And he was frustrated by that, and he decided uh, to go directly to the market himself. Uh, and that's the major mistake he did, and that's how we discovered that he was a forger. Uh, what happened uh, is that he consigned in 2006 uh, a very important work by supposedly Kappendonk, but of course it was his own work, uh, to a small auction house called Lempert uh, in Germany. Uh, and he said, I'm going to bypass my network of dealers uh, and I'm going to go straight to the market. Uh, unfortunately for him, uh, when the Kappendonk you see here uh, was offered at auction, it was one of the works that was reproduced in the catalog resume, but not illustrated but attributed to that number, uh, it made a world record. Uh, it made a huge price. Everybody was talking about it. Uh, everybody was waiting for the auction. And uh, on the day, it made 2.8 million euros, which was a record for the artist. And it was purchased uh, by this um, Ukrainian dealer in Geneva called Larissa Shertok, uh, who bought it on behalf of a client. Uh, it made the news, world record. Everybody was very happy. And uh, she, um, the, the auction was right before Christmas time. Uh, so she decided uh, to um, send the work to her client. Uh, but because of the holiday season, uh, all the transports and everything was, was closed. And it was too late already before Christmas to send the actual work of art to her buyer, to the client who had mandated her to bid on it and to purchase it. Uh, so what she did instead is as a Christmas gift, she sent him the catalog resume uh, to, this, to her buyer. And the buyer called her a few days later and said, uh, well, thank you very much for the catalog resume. Uh, I found my work, uh, the one I just purchased, but it's not illustrated. Is that normal? Uh, of course, this, uh, this buyer was not very familiar with the art market, and he found it strange that the work was not illustrated. Uh, of course, Larissa felt very bad about this. She said, oh, I hope he's not doubting the work. Uh, what can I do? Uh, so she called uh, the specialist, uh, Mrs. Firminich, uh, who was out on holidays and who said, listen, uh, when I come back from holiday in January, I'll come back, look at the work again, and uh, I'll confirm that everything is okay. But so far, so good. I have absolutely no doubt that the work is genuine. But that wasn't enough for Larissa. Uh, she thought, I have to get to the bottom of this and I can't make him wait for two, three weeks till Mrs. Firmanish comes back. I'm gonna do my own research. And what she did is she looked at the painting, she looked at um, the verso of the painting and she found this amazing label uh, of the private collection of Mr. Fleischstein, the director of the gallery Der Sturm, um, which is the label you see here. Uh, and this is not the label of the Cap and Donk, it's another label that uh, Beltraki used uh, for Max Ernst painting. And uh, uh, she wasn't familiar very much with Mr. Uh, Fleischstein's own collection, uh, but she knew that a friend of hers, uh, Mr. Ralph Jensch, uh, who's uh, the expert for Gross, working out of Rome, um, 
has spent a lot of his personal time, if I may say so, uh, researching on the Fleischstein collection. Uh, so she sent him all the details of the painting and a photograph of the back of the painting saying, uh, do you have this cap and donk in your own records? Uh, did you know that Mr. Fleischstein had this painting in his personal collection? And Mr. Jensch was very quick uh, to come back to her and said, wow, what an amazing label. I've never seen it. Uh, it's funny because it seems to be uh, a woodcut uh, portrait of Mr. Fleischstein himself that's very similar uh, to a photograph of him that's a well-known photograph of Mr. Fleischstein. But in 30 years that I've been researching the collection of Mr. Fleischstein, I've never seen an ex libris label, uh, a Samlung Fleischstein. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, and he found it very strange. And that was the mistake that Mr. Beltraki made. Because for the first time, instead of reproducing the Karin Weiler label or Der Storm label, he invented a Fleischstein label to make it even more credible. Amazing. And he created this label. And um, Mr. Jensch uh, asked Mr. Schertok, she said, he said, listen, can you look at the label more carefully? Uh, can you look at it with a lens and try to tell me more about it? Um, and when she looked at it closely, uh, she realized that the label was pixelized. Uh, so that it was actually a printed label uh, through a method that just wasn't available in 1910, 1914, when the painting was created. Uh, so it was a fake. So Mr. Jensch said, you need immediately to find all the paintings that have this label. Uh, and we need to regroup uh, all the works that possess this label, which is clearly a fake. Uh, that's when Larissa called me at Christie's and said, Thomas, um, I want to talk to you about a, a, a label of uh, Mr. Fleischbein's personal collection, uh, which is a fake, and I want you to research at Christie's if you can find other works of art that you may have sold uh, with this particular label. And uh, uh, at the time, I didn't pay any attention and say, oh, another phone call just before Christmas, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to try to research this label. And actually, I found that in one of our catalogs, uh, we had illustrated this label to a, as a comparative for a painting that we had that had this label because we found the label incredible ourselves, uh, uh, thinking, of course, that it was real. Uh, so I identified a few pictures and I sent it back to her. And she told me at the time, she said, Thomas, we're dealing with a huge case of forgery. And I just didn't believe her. I just said, what is she talking about? How can this cap and don't be fake? Everybody saw it. Nobody said anything. Uh, what about this label? So, I was still resisting uh, the idea, and that just shows you how convincing uh, Beltraki's package was. Uh, and, um, and then it went on um, for a few months. Uh, of course, she contacted uh, Lampert, uh, who had terms of conditions of sale that were quite rigorous, where I think they only reimburse in case of forgery 10% of their commission, let alone the hammer price. Uh, so she was quite upset and um, she took legal action against Lampert's uh, and that went on and went on. And in the meantime, uh, I discussed it with my colleagues at Christie's and we decided uh, to recover uh, all the paintings, uh, there were two or three, that had this label to examine them ourselves. It's quite amazing to see the resistance uh, when we face a fake and forgery. Not that we think that we can't make mistakes, uh, but it seems so unlikely, uh, especially when you sell something on the open market, uh, when something has a provenance, uh, when something has exhibition record, uh, when it's even in the catalog resume, and when it comes with a certificate from the leading expert. Uh, we just couldn't really believe it. Uh, so what we did is uh, we got these two paintings back. Uh, sorry for the poor quality of the photo. This is a photo that dates back 15 years. Uh, we got them back from the buyers and we decided uh, to send them uh, to uh, a lab to examine the pigment. Now, laboratory analysis in, in our business, as most of you probably know, is never good news. Uh, and, um, and, and some people ask us, why don't you do pigment analysis every single time you have a painting, uh, just to make sure that it all corresponds? Uh, well, we don't do that for several reasons. Uh, first of all, because it's a very costly process and it's a lengthy process as well. It takes between 
four or five weeks to have an answer from the lab on the pigment analysis. And then the pigment analysis can only give you a date. Uh, it can only date the pigment. Uh, uh, pigments are uh, quite a, an amazing, uh, have an amazing history uh, because every single pigment, can, once it's chemically analyzed, can be identified and you can date precisely when the pigment was produced, when it was made available to the market, and in which market it was made available first and what year. Um, so we dropped off both paintings to the lab and uh, we waited uh, for um, their reply. Uh, what was interesting is, of course, we were a bit surprised by the similarity, which there shouldn't be any between Dürer and Kappendorf, but when we returned the paintings, it was even worse because the back looked exactly similar. They had similar stretchers, they had similar labels, and similar disposition of labels. Although their provenance was similar, but the exhibition were different, all the labels were put in the same places. There was always one label on the canvas itself, and the other labels were stretched out in a similar way. Here in the photograph, you recognize on the left the Fleischstein label uh, that we discussed earlier. Uh, when the lab came back to us, the news was amazing. They told us, listen, the pigments don't match. And believe me, the pigments did not exist in 1910, 1915. It's just not possible, and certainly not in 1906 when the Durand was supposedly painted. Uh, it's not possible uh, because uh, it dates from a much, much later date. Uh, so, of course, the reaction was, are you sure that you took the right pigment in the right place? Because it's possible that a later restorer came in and restored the painting, and what you took was not the original pigment, but perhaps the restorer's pigment from the 70s or 80s. And he said, no, 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 it's not possible. Watch this. And he explained to us that everything was aged artificially. Uh, here is a, a photograph of um, the nails on the stretcher of both paintings, similar nails, but you can even see that Beltraki went to the trouble of rusting the nails uh, so that they look genuine. Uh, and more importantly, and that's quite amazing, he said, you see, there's a wash, a, a recent wash on the back of the paintings and the back of the stretcher to age them and to make, look, to make them look a lot older than they really are. Uh, the label is pixelized, and more importantly, in both paintings, you had one nail missing between the canvas and the stretcher. And where the nail used to be, quote unquote, there was sort of a ring around the hole of rust. Makes sense. The nail rusted, then it fell away, and it left a trace on the canvas. And the lab told us, you see this ring around the hole? It's not rust, it's paint. It's completely faked. Unbelievable. Of course, for us, it was very, very complicated uh, because we immediately had to reimburse um, the buyers, uh, of course, and then we had to try to get our money back from the sellers, which often, and in these two cases, were dealers who no longer were in a position to reimburse us. Uh, here we see uh, the label from Der Storm, uh, a label that when we see them, we're always excited because it's a sign of usually great quality and, and great uh, provenance and exhibition record. And this label is actually uh, pixelized. Uh, it's aged artificially. And Beltraki even went further. Uh, what he did is he tore, uh, as you can see in the lower right of this label, he tore the label. And where he tore it, uh, he left the canvas in its original condition, as if um, the label had been complete at one point and had protected the color of the original canvas in the back for many, many years. Uh, and then when it tore it off, you can see that the canvas is still looks as if it's untouched and original. But all what you see here is completely fake. Unbelievable. Of course, uh, Beltraki uh, was caught, uh, not through us because we're dealing with successive dealers uh, that didn't really know uh, where the work originated from, but through Lampert's uh, and through the cap and donkey consigned. And, um, and there was a trial coming up and we were absolutely fascinated uh, to wait for the trial in Germany and to try to find out uh, how he knew all this. Because it's one thing to reproduce uh, the style, the stylistic, the painterly style of a painter. 
But how did Mr. Beltraki know about provenance, exhibition record, uh, expertise, uh, major galleries? How did he know all this? Uh, and we always thought that he must have had an accomplice or a series of, of accomplices that must have knew about the market and about the process that we go through to identify a work of art. Uh, unfortunately, he was trialed in Germany and he pleaded guilty to forge 56 paintings. And uh, in Germany, if you plead guilty uh, to save uh, the taxpayer money, uh, the, the trial is halted, it's stopped, and uh, you go on straight away to the sentence. So actually, during his trial, uh, there were no witness, uh, and nobody had an opportunity to really understand uh, his work progress and his work process, sorry, uh, to how exactly it happened. Um, it made a huge deal in the press in Germany, and because he, was, uh, he pleaded guilty, uh, he ended up with six years in jail, uh, only nighttime jail. During the day, he was allowed to go back home and continue to paint his own works. And he became this sort of star. Uh, and although we were all frustrated uh, by the fact we didn't have the information of how he was able to know so much and to create a complete package, uh, there was no way of us of knowing anything. And uh, today we're absolutely certain that the dealers we're dealing with uh, who consigned the works were absolutely not aware uh, that they were fakes and forgeries. And uh, the specialists, the experts that made the mistakes of providing certificates were not absolutely aware that they were dealing with a forger and were acting in good faith. And that's what's so scary. Um, of course, Beltraki uh, wrote a book and uh, even made a movie, uh, as you see the poster here. Uh, and it was really frustrating because when we narrated the story and when we were interviewed by journalists about this, uh, there was just sort of, you know, a Robin Hood status that he had obtained and, uh, and everybody was sort of admiring this man uh, who himself in his book said that uh, he forged his painting to be able to finance um, the medical care that his wife needed because she had cancer. Uh, and of course, you know, the whole book is a complete lie. Uh, and, and the book doesn't mention uh, the several houses he had in the south of France uh, that he paid millions, of course, uh, and that uh, his main motivation was money and money only. So we never got really to the bottom of it and we never got uh, the full story of uh, the Beltraki. But what, um, what we understood uh, is that we were not careful enough. Uh, because, of course, after the matter, uh, we did proper research. Uh, first of all, uh, we did a bit of research on um, Werner Jäger, the famous grandfather, this illustrious provenance from the 20s. Uh, and we realized that in 1925, Werner Jäger was 18. Uh, so at 18 years old, there was no way that he was already a successful industrialist, and there was no way that he could have purchased all these paintings. Uh, and that nobody had checked. Uh, nobody knew that it was the case. Uh, and then, of course, when we opened the catalogs from Der Stamm from the 20s, when we looked at the provenance prior to 2000, we realized that nothing was illustrated, that everything was circumstantial, that everything was attributed uh, to this exhibition, to this number in the catalog resume, but there was no actual proof. Of course, there couldn't be any proof because the, these paintings didn't exist but we hadn't been thorough enough. And we hadn't been thorough enough uh, because we looked at the paintings with absolutely no doubt that there could be a risk that they were fakes and forgeries uh, and that they were faked. We were absolutely convinced from day one that we were dealing with the original paintings. Um, and that's where I think Beltraki was particularly brilliant uh, is uh, by creating such a complete pedigree he provided us indirectly with all the answers that we needed even before we saw the paintings. And therefore, uh, we came into the game and we looked at these works with already a story in our mind, with already, you know, um, uh, an admiration, a certain admiration for the quality of the work and especially for the provenance and for these big labels by Der Stamm and by Kahnweiler. And since they weren't top of the notch works of art, they were usually sort of B pluses or second rate works, 
we didn't spend enough time looking at them and examining them carefully and double checking the facts. Um, and I think um, that's uh, the biggest strength of a good faker is that he puts the seed in your head uh, not to doubt the work from day one. Uh, and he reverses it. Instead of looking at a painting and saying, what makes it authentic and doubt it, uh, you come in and you look at the painting saying, yes, it's real. I have no reason to doubt it. And then as you go along and you find there's a certificate, you find there's nice labels in the back, you find out that there's a great provenance uh, that actually doesn't exist. But when you get all these things, they convince, they convince you of your initial gut feeling uh, that everything is right. You have no reason to doubt it. Uh, and that's why well, he's very good. Um, uh, so Beltrec, uh, today is making his own art. Today he's out of jail. And uh, I put him up here with other great forgers. Uh, and as you see uh, in the last photograph, uh, it's myself. Uh, why did I put myself up there? Remember that whole story about Magritte I told you earlier on at the beginning of the presentation? It never existed. I made it up. This painting, of course, is not at the Royal Museum. It's a painting that I made myself. It's not a Magritte. Thank you very much.